I'm, Aloha, I'm, I'm Joe Ritter. I, I think I know probably half of you. So uh, welcome to the Institute for Astronomy Advanced Technology Research Center. Uh, and it is a great pleasure tonight to have my friend Mark Millis uh, here giving us a talk. I have a few notes, so I'm, I'm just going to read them. Um, so uh, when I was a, a team leader in advanced concepts at NASA, this guy was coming around doing these talks on breakthrough propulsion physics. And I thought, wow, I should go do that. My boss said, oh, yeah, go meet him. And so that was 16 years ago, 17 years ago, something like that. Yes, I'm really that old. Um, and uh, uh, I saw Mark again a few years ago because I went to a conference to uh, meet with people and talk about how one could approach interstellar propulsion um, and going to other stars, which is something that is incredibly difficult, but we try to keep it in real science, not science fiction here. Uh, but it's something like maybe 5,000, 50,000 times more difficult than going to Mars, and we haven't even done that. That doesn't mean we shouldn't set our bar high, right? So. Uh, my, my friend Mark Millis decided he was going to come out here. And what's better than a rocket scientist? A propulsion physicist. Um, so Mark is a propulsion physicist uh, who formerly ran the Breakthrough Propulsion Physics program at NASA. Uh, he was at NASA for 30 years. Uh, he founded Tau Zero, which is sort of a loose collection around the planet of people who are interested in these exotic problems involved in interstellar travel. Um, he worked on ion thruster development, and he worked on uh, engineering cockpit displays for back when they were doing zero-g with Learjets before the days of the KC-135. Uh, Mark worked on rocket engine instrumentation. Uh, and these days, he's out on Maui just kind of sitting and thinking and thinking about what it means to define an inertial frame, what it is that defines an inertial frame. And so that's, that's what he's doing out here. Uh, and with, so that's his background. And tonight, M Mark is going to tell you about the enormous challenges and approaches to star flight. So uh, please welcome Mark Millis. There's no test at the end. Okay. Um, okay, now I've got the convenient uh, clicker, too. I'm going to start off on uh, some familiar ground. Um, how many of you recognize these vehicles? Yeah, okay. This is what we normally think of, of interstellar flight. And, and these reasons, you can almost hear the music. And, um, uh, well, <coughs> yeah, Captain Kirk dating aliens or just the idea to get away from it all. Um, that's the easy stuff, and what's nice about interstellar flight, um, not only for the site, I mean the fiction, definitely uh, all sorts of things you can do with it, but there's so much out there in reality that is undiscovered that we don't know what's out there, and beginning to think about, well, how to get out there. So as a starting point, uh, star flight is not the same as taking the space flight that we know and just doing it more intensely we're going to have to deviate quite a bit uh, from how we do things. Um, another thing that you typically don't realize until you start looking at the numbers, light speed, the fastest thing we know, is actually really slow when it comes to moving interstellar distances. Also, the amount of energy that we need to do it is so enormous that it's a matter of a societal impact. It's not just like... Um, one organization could pull it off. It's going to have to be more like a, a world commitment to really make it happen. And then when you look at kind of, and a lot of these are estimates. We're making our best guesses. But as far as the timing of things, some things that might actually happen sooner, which are very provocative and will change how we go about solving these problems, um, are when artificial intelligence becomes more intelligent than uh, people, which is, I think, predicted around 2045, 2050, last I heard. And then also something called transhumanism. How many have ever even heard of transhumanism? Oh, more of you. Um, well, to give an example, uh, I have glasses, that's clear. I actually wear hearing aids, and I have some fillings. So in a sense, I'm already slightly transhumanist. It's the idea is you're starting to modify your body with technology to better adapt to your surroundings. Um, but the idea of taking that even farther, uh, uh, people are toying with. 
Okay. Now let's try and give a sense of how big is astronomically big. Um, this is, I'm going to try more than a way to try and convey the scale of things to you. Um, it's hard because it goes beyond what we're familiar with, comparisons. So uh, for starters, uh, this is an artist's rendering of our galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy. We can't actually step back and see our galaxy this way because otherwise we'd have to be here and we're not there, we're here. Um, as is everyone, everyone in history who's ever lived is, was there. Um, but to try and put this escape, this is just a, a, a 1,000 light year radius. Uh, how many people already know what a light year is? Oh, not bad. Oh, it, it's the distance that light would go in a year. So 1,000 light years means that's how fast, uh, how far light will travel in 1,000 years. So if you had an uh, intelligent civilization here with a magical telescope looking at Earth right now, they'd be seeing the Middle Ages. Um, so, and, and when you cast that on this scale of thing, it's like, yeah, the whole time is a huge part of the challenge. So let's zoom in to 1,000 uh, light years. The circle is 1,000 light year. And these are not to scale, um, but these dots re, uh, represent the stars that fit into that much space. Um, and something I want to mention, this is actually a screenshot from my phone of an application called Exoplanet, uh, where you can take it and you can zoom in and zoom out of the galaxy. Um, it has the full listing of exoplanets that have been discovered over which they're beyond 3,200 um, exoplanets. Um, and you can see where they are and, and zoom around. Uh, let's take a, one more factor of 10 n, and now we're just at 100 light years. As you can see, they're getting far sparse. I could take it one more step to just 10 light years, but there's only about 10 star systems within 10 light years. So beginning to get a sense of how things are spread out. Um, now Tuesday, uh, NASA announced that they had a whole bunch more uh, exoplanets they have confirmed. An exoplanet is a planet around a star other than our own sun. And these particular ones are the ones that might be habitable. Now that term is used very loosely so far. And for comparison, um, here's the Earth, that little dot there, and there's Mars, and there's Venus. Now on this scale, uh, this green zone is the habitable zone where you could have liquid water, which is thought to be necessary for life as we know it. Um, this scale is, these stars are around, I mean, these planets are around different types of stars in us, so it's a way of kind of scoping out where they are. And if you notice, too, a lot of them are pretty big. When you see Earth is fairly small there, I mean, there's a relatively small one there and there, um, another small one there. Um, the detection methods had trouble finding the really small planets, so there might be more than this, but so far, those are the ones that are considered potentially habitable. Um, and if you want to look for them in the night sky, um, this is just kind of a map now uh, of where these things in the night sky. You'll notice that there's a whole cluster of things up here. That's not because of some weird astronomical thing. Uh, that's because that's where the Kepler telescope has been aimed. You know, it's looking along uh, one thing. Um, and you'll notice all these names here are Kepler, number this, that's this. And then you come over here, you have other things like Wolf and uh, GC and these other. These are other um, telescopes that are looking too. Um, but this is kind of the distribution of those potentially habitable ones. OK, now it gets into the harder part. Um, I'm going to explain this chart. I know this chart is confusing and hard or whatever, but when trying to convey the immense distances and time scales involved, I'm having to resort to this. So let's start easy with just one little scale, the time scale. Um, if you'll notice, instead of a ruler that goes one inch, two inch, three inches, we're going by decades, a year, a decade, a century, a millennium, each time we go one notch up, we've gone up a factor of 10. And the reason why I'm having to do this on this chart, it's the only way to compress down all this stuff into something that fits on a chart. I mean, after all, the galaxy I don't think would really fit here very well. Uh, OK, now then there's the distance scale. Again, we're having to do things by factors of 10. And uh, so here we have Earth down at the beginning. And at the other extreme end, we have the diameter of our galaxy. And the question is, where's our nearest neighboring star? It's over four light years away. It's actually a binary star system and then another uh, smaller star system uh, nearby. There's apparently a planet around the uh, double star system, but not one that appears to be in the habitable zone. It looks like it's too hot. Um, but uh, 
I guess another point to bring out now, to try and find analogies to explain how much farther away these things are. Okay, I've probably been talking for less than eight minutes, which is about the same amount of time it takes for light from our own sun to reach the Earth. Like a short conversation. Well, this is over four light years away. That's comparable to, say, getting a college education. So if you think the level of difficulty in having a conversation and getting a college graduation, uh, that's kind of a scale of the level of difficulty we're talking about for space flight to star flight. Okay, let's dig this a little bit deeper. Now, trying to guess, well, where are those potentially other habitable planets? Uh, several years ago, a colleague uh, tried to do some estimates of where might the closest one be, and to try and do that, and then from there, that's why this region is kind of fuzzy, because we don't really know where they'll be, uh, but probably this far out. And uh, interesting, now that we have some uh, data from the ones that are out there, um, these are some of those potential habitable worlds. Uh, there's one at 13 light years away, 14 light years away, 22 light years away, 40 light years away, and then it jumps up to 500 light years away. Um, so again, you know, we're talking scales, and <coughs> if you take okay, 22 light years away, that's like a career span compared to the eight minutes of conversation. And 500 years, that's like, well, a civilization, building a civilization. So, you know, we're on a completely different scale of... Uh, things. So what about extraterrestrial intelligence? Again, these are huge guesses because right now we don't know of any. Um, but if on a habitable planet, if there's a chance, if there's, okay, with intelligent civilization, not all habitable planets will lead to life and not all life will lead to intelligent civilization. So it uh, ventures to guess that they're probably going to be even farther out, and as far as running rough guesstimates, they say they're probably going to be at least this far out, which is pretty far. And now, let's talk about, well, how fast can we get, how long will it take us to get to some of these places? And we're starting from the Voyager spacecraft, uh, which left our solar system not that long ago. And by the solar system, I don't mean beyond Pluto. There's even farther than that, uh, where there's something called the heliopause, where the effects from our sun meet with the galactic background. Um, and it's been traveling ever since 1977. So that's almost four decades of travel. And it's going a measly, you can either read it this way, or let's see if I can say it right, six thousandths of a percent of the speed of light. Uh, so it's moving uh, pretty slowly. Um, but to see how that works for other things, okay, here's the rest of the chart. What I've done now here is other speed limits. Every time we bump one of those, we're going ten times faster, all the way up to the light speed limit. And the way you use this is you ask, well, how fast would we have to go to reach Alpha Centauri within a human life frame? Okay, so here's what you do, is, okay, where's Alpha Centauri? There it is. What's a human lifespan? Okay, we go up to a pretty much approaching a century, and where those two intersect, we look, okay, what kind of speed curve is that near? Almost a tenth the speed of light. Not too bad. Okay, let's say if we want to get to a potentially uh, extraterrestrial civilization within a human lifetime. Oop, we can't do it. We have to exceed the light speed limit. And that's why this whole area is dark, because until we know whether or not we can do that, those are just plain inaccessible. Um, another thing to point out here in terms of trying to guess ener uh, understand energy, every time you go up by a factor of 10 in speed, you go up by a factor of at least 100 in energy, um, which means by the time you're bucking up against tenths the speed of light, you're talking an awful lot more energy than it took to send the Voyager on its journey. Okay. Well, it's, Voyager wasn't the fastest spacecraft we've had. It's the farthest out, but the fastest one we've had is not that different. I mean, on this scale, on those charts where we have to use factors of tens rather than just um, like a ruler, it's not going to show up. Um, this is a way to try and get an idea now of the variety of approaches of thinking. How do you make that challenge? Uh, you can start with what we've already done in flight, Voyager, um, which use chemical rockets, much like a lot of the rockets you see, and also gravity assist. That means when it flies very close to a planetary body and gets some extra oomph to send it off farther. 
or you can use something simple as solar sails. I'll be talking about what some of these mean a little bit more, but for now it's just kind of a comparison of the different things. Uh, something easy to do that we know that we can do is just a matter of doing the engineering, or bumping it up to next te technology where, okay, let's take the technology and make it even better uh, uh, on the edge of what we can do, and then let's bump up technology to the upper limit of the laws of physics that we understand them. There's approaches there too, things like uh, fusion rockets and use of antimatter. And then there's a, a line to be crossed here. Rather than continuing the technology based on the laws of physics we already understand, why not go back to the physics to see if we can make further advances to find breakthroughs to circumvent all those limits for things like non-rocket space drives or warp drives. How many have heard of warp drives? <laughs> How many know that they're actually in the peer-reviewed scientific literature? They are. Um, I'll come back to that. Now let's put this in the scale of how long is it going to take these things to uh, get anywhere. Well, Voyager, if it was headed towards Alpha Centauri, would take 80,000 years to get there. Um, now, human civilization, I think, is on the order of 100,000 years. So if the cavemen had launched Voyager, it might be reaching uh, someplace interesting by now. But that's way beyond the warranty period. Um, <laughs> Okay, Okay. now uh, things like uh, simple light sails, they would take millennia, that means thousands of years, or if you boosted it with some electric propulsion or some other things that we know how to do, you might be able to get it down to centuries. Um, if you go to the next step technology, and depending upon how you run the numbers, you might be able to get it down to set centuries or perhaps even as fast as decades. Um, and the hope is with pushing technology to the limit of the physics that we know, you could get it down to decades. Um, and the idea of wanting to do, uh, look for new propulsion physics is you want the uh, trip times to be short enough so where Congress will actually say, yeah, um, I think I'll fund that. Um, that's within my uh, time span or before you lose attention. Um, okay, now also to try and get some sort of sense of how much these things might cost. Um, the Voyagers, both of them came in at roughly a billion. Um, this would probably cost low billions. Once you start upping it to these areas, though, there's this other little detail down here, plus infrastructure. Um, I will get to that. That means they have to build other things to help make these things happen, whereas you know, that you could just launch from Earth without needing extra things. Um, and also this incalculable means that once you go upon a certain amount, we don't even have enough information now to accurately figure out what that might take. Um, okay, all those things were probes. What about the idea of sending people? Well, when you realize how long we were taking to get there, whether it's 80,000 years or millennia or centuries, um, that shifts the idea to talking about world ships, where, and starting from the 1950s here, um, from a science fiction and science fact magazine, uh, the idea of hollowing out an asteroid and putting all sorts of life in there and it rotates to provide uh, artificial gravity. And then in the 70s, uh, Gerald O'Neill did an upgrade of that. Um, now these were intended for just near Earth uh, as a other place for humanity to survive in case anything bad ever happened to Earth, which maybe might happen. Um, and what's happening now is there's a group from um, the International Space University. How many have ever heard of the International Space University? Ah, good, okay. It's a cool thing. Each summer in a different part of the world, they have a uh, intense summer program where they bring people together from different countries and different disciplines to work together on space projects, um, not just for the sake of the space education, but for the sake of having different cultures work together. Um, and if you look at the history of space, then one of the reasons that I got into it is it seems to be one of those pathways of lasting peace, conquering frontiers instead of each other kind of thing. Um, and uh, I did one of those sessions. But that's a cool idea. It's still existing. And they're at the point of refining some of these things. Still early stages. But the one thing you'll notice, these things are huge. And when you're asking, well, how many people are on this? Think a stadium full of people. Um, and you need that many people to have a sustainable gene pool that's going to last the perhaps thousands of years it takes for this to get anywhere. Uh, but I'll come back to the, the concept of world ships here, uh, in a different context. 
let's talk about some of the other propulsion uh, ideas. Uh, solar sails, and they have, the idea is old. There's all sorts of books on it. This was one that recently that covers a fair span of possibilities. The idea here is if you have a, um, a thin film floating in space, when the sunlight hits it, well, actually sunlight hitting anything has a little bit of force on it, but a thin film without much mass in space where there isn't a layer, it's going to move it. And if you do the numbers, it will move it pretty reasonably if you get fairly large sails. Uh, space sails have already been flown. There's been at least three demonstrator missions just in, in uh, Earth orbit. Um, and there's continued studies about how to make them wide enough, how to deploy them to big enough, and what can you do with them. And then you can even take it to another level about, well, why don't you add maybe a nuclear power source and some electric propulsion to help you continue to get some things later on. And people have looked at these things and various uh, ways. And like I said before, these are the ones that might be able to get things down to centuries at best, uh, just millennia if you're not using any extra help. Um, so the idea is, well, why don't we just let the sunlight push on it? Why don't we put these giant lasers or giant microwaves um, in Earth orbit and help push the giant sails along? And these ideas uh, are quite old. And for fun, I copied something from one of the old papers. Uh, yes, paper. This was 1984 before these things were on computer screens. Um, and I want to point out a few things here. Uh, one, this is a 100 kilometer diameter sail that it's pushing on. Uh, this lens, I think, was also either 100 or 1,000 kilometers in diameter, so we're talking big things. And the uh, fun one to point out, this little laser here um, to push on, that says 26 terawatts of power. Uh, to put that in scale of how much energy it is, that's like 10% of the entire power that all of humanity uses right now, or well, back in 2007. So, you know, that's an awful lot of power. Um, but those are ideas that uh, were thought of. And something that came around uh, very recently is something called Breakthrough Starshot. This was in the news a few weeks ago. How many have heard about that? Where a uh, famous, OK, uh, uh, a Russian billionaire and former physicist uh, puts up 100 million to do a study. Same idea, laser push its sails. But what he's doing is instead of a 26 terawatt laser, he's only going for 100 gigawatts, a lot less, <coughs> but still really potent and Earth-based. And then his sail, instead of being kilometers big, is only 4 meters by 4 meters, which is roughly like 12-ish by 12-ish feet, or basically the size of a decent-sized bedroom, um, with a very tiny probe on it with the smarts of like a cell phone. And the, the hope is, or what their, their goal that they're working to is, can you get that up to 20% uh, the speed of light, in which case you could get to Alpha Centauri in just 22 years. Um, now, it doesn't stop. It just keeps flying by. Um, and I'm, the details about getting signal back and putting that much power into a tiny sail without destroying it. Lots of engineering details there. Um, but it's kind of cool that someone's actually willing to put up uh, some study to do that. And this is the next step technology category. Um, before I go into the uh, next idea, a little bit of history. There was an idea back in the uh, late 50s, early 60s of nu using nuclear bombs for propulsion. Uh, you just drop a nuclear bomb out the back, detonate it, it pushes your spacecraft up, and you just keep doing that repeatedly. Um, it was called Project Orion. Um, they did designs for this. Um, they did experimental tests with conventional explosives that, yes, indeed, you can uh, propel a vehicle up that way. Uh, this was designed for either just reaching Earth orbit with a large mass or going to Mars. This wasn't an interstellar idea. And this is a, a model that's actually in an office of one of my bosses, 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 boss um, at uh, Glenn Research Center, uh, what's the mark? So, um, and, and these containers uh, have all the nuclear bombs in them to propel yourself along. And what a great way to get away, or to get rid of all those nuclear bombs, uh, space flight. So um, a few years later, the British Interplanetary Society uh, decided to take an idea like this and say, well, what if you really want to do an interstellar mission, to do an engineering design study more carefully, not just guesses, but actually numbers to paper? And they came up with this rough idea or, or a rough design study for an interstellar probe. Um, this was to go to Bernard Star, which I think is five light years away in 50 years, so getting up to a tenth the speed of light. 
And um, right now there's another group called Acre Center Stellar doing a, uh, a revisit of this with whatever uh, advances in technology have happened in the meantime. Um, but when you start talking about this scale, and I'll bring that to light four, you also need to have some extra infrastructure in space. This is an artist's rendering of mining craft getting helium-3 from the gas giant Uranus. And I will avoid the temptation about making gas giants from the other pronunciation of Uranus. Um, but I'm sure that we've all gone there. Um, and the infrastructure, I mean, to be able to create this sort of equipment and basis to mine this and collect it and load it onto this spaceship, and to give you an idea of how big that spaceship is, uh, how many people recognize um, this vehicle, the Saturn V? Okay, well, um, this was the vehicle that sent people to the moon. And on this scale, the people were up inside that little triangle there, so a person is probably about the size of that laser dot. And all of the rest of this stuff was pretty much the propellant it took to get that little bit to the moon. So when you're talking about getting something to uh, interstellar distances, you need an awful lot more propellant. I mean, you're going to be doing an awful lot of mining. And so this just kind of shows the scale. By the way, rockets, they work by spewing out the propellant in one direction, which pushes the spacecraft in the other. If you want to go faster, farther, or carry more, you need more propellant. And then you need more propellant to propel the extra propellant, and it adds up exponentially, literally. And um, so rockets to do interstellar flight, it's a challenge. Um, which begs the question, too, well, when can we do these things? I mean, I see the numbers here and some of these things, but what sort of timeline are we at? And OK, I have to resort to another figure. I'm an engineer and a scientist. We use these things to wrap our brain around, so I hope we can do this. What this compares is history, future history, and how much energy prowess we have at our disposal to do space missions, compared with how much energy it would take to do certain space missions. And um, this line right here is the average of if you took our history of energy production so far and extrapolated into the future where we get more and more energy prowess as time goes on, um, at what point do we cross a threshold for a certain uh, mission, like a slow-moving colony ship, something that's just 25 million kilograms, which is a small colony ship, and only going fast enough to where it can escape from our solar system, um, and say, okay, it takes that much energy, so when do we cross that line in two centuries from now? Okay, well, this blue area here, that's actually the uncertainty of those energy rates. So, you know, some, we might go faster, we might go slower. Um, so, you know, there's some wiggle room there. Now, when you're talking about, well, what about one of those fast interstellar probes that we were just talking about? Well, that's even more energy. And here's the weird rub about the energy, is that when you move something faster and faster, if you double the mass, you double the required energy. Okay, if you double the speed, you've quadrupled the amount of energy you need. If you go 10 times faster, you need 100 times more energy. So going faster costs you more energy-wise than adding mass. So let's flip that the other way. Well, given the amount of energy that we have today, what's the size mass that we could, in principle, send to Alpha Centauri? And oh, by the way, this is, uh, I used a 71-year flight time plus four years to get the data back. That's 75 years. I thought that was kind of at the extreme edge of what perhaps a future career span might be. Um, instead of 50 years, only if we live longer and, and whatever. Um, well, we could potentially send one kilogram, which is a little over two pounds. So imagine a decent piece of fruit. That's about all we can handle right now. Um, and that's also why the Starshot folks are going for something as small, like a little telephone, rather than uh, something big. But the point is, is that the type of energy levels you need to do this are enormous. Um, but just one other thing on this chart. These little lines here, lunar flux and solar flux, what those means, this is the line of how much energy we would have at our disposal if the entire su side of the moon that is facing the sun had solar panels to collect all that energy. And this is how much energy uh, we would get if the entire surface of the Earth that's facing the sun, granted that's 
well, that much area, forget the logistics of how you pull that off, how much energy we'd have. So, uh, you know, to eventually get to these energy levels is not ridiculous. How long it will take us to get there, less of a problem. One more point before I leave this chart. I wasn't sure where it potted on here because I had trouble double checking the information. But when we're talking these kind of ener uh, energy levels, we're at the point where if it was misused improperly, it could vaporize the surface of the Earth, which means that a side effect of looking into these things is that before we can pull off the technology, we've got to pull off the sociological gain of applying our energy for the greater good rather than against each other. And if we don't get past that, we're not going anywhere. Um, and when you run these numbers, this is kind of cool about studying this stuff, is that until you actually sit down and run these numbers, you don't really realize what sort of situation we're in. And um, that in order to do cool stuff like this, that we actually have to learn to behave first. Kind of silly, isn't it? Yeah. We have to grow up. Okay, which brings the things, why with all these things so daunting, would we even try and do it now? Um, back to the world ships. They become a context for thinking about social issues in a scale that removes it from things that are more troublesome. I'll get to that later. Um, the other thing, right now, missions to Mars and to the moon about setting up colonies, they're all about picking the best technology from a variety of things, of optimizing things and down-selecting to one really good method. But what about all the other ideas that are out there, the potential breakthroughs that might happen later? Who, who's thinking about those? Well, actually, not many people. So by upping the anti interstellar flight, it provides a venue and a context to think about these larger uh, potential solutions um, rather than just getting stuck about thinking about the next step. I like this one. It gives us... I, I use this phrase way too much, conquering frontiers instead of each other. Um, of course, after we got some territory out there, it might turn out, well, let's get that. Um, also, you know, it's cool. I mean, there's an aspect to this that when you think, what do I want to do? What do I want to spend my time on? Uh, yeah, this is cool. So, um, okay, about the world ships. Mars and moon, co and moon colonies, when they're, they still have Earth that they can rely on. So a lot of the uh, closed loop life support and things that they're studying aren't really fully closed loop. When you up the ante to a colony ship, you have to do that all the way. So it changes the scale of the problem and how you go about doing it. And the other one, the ethics of, well, is it okay if we colonize another planet? Uh, and what about ourselves and all sorts of issues with that about compatible biomes and all that. It's a way to start uh, thinking about that. But the one that I like, um, and this is something, when I got into this, I didn't even realize this and realize how important this was. And in discussions we've had with other colleagues, is that right now on Earth, when we have debates about which governance model you want or who you want to vote for or whatever, um, often in history they can get ugly and the winning culture is not necessarily the one that was the best. Uh, but whoever won the war. When you set the scale so far in the future that it doesn't look real to a lot of people, you kind of remove from that hot, those hot buttons. So you can study it more analytically and more rationally. And um, it becomes a way to toy with, well, what sort of biomes do we need for a fully sustainable thing? What sort of uh, social model, governance model, could have sustainable peace for millennia when you're trapped in this uh, smaller spacecraft. And also, along lines, how do you have meaningful life for all the individuals on board and tie that in together? And so in these contexts of thinking isolated world ships, it gives you kind of a crucible to wrap your brain around these things. It's not going to be um, you know, turning into wars right away. Um, but also, if we succeed at answering any of those questions, well, that applies directly on Earth right away. Um, and hopefully without a war to make the point. About the revolutionary progress, um, when it comes to the technology beyond Moon and Mars, even though these are based on the laws of physics that we know, the type of scales that we're talking about and the other options, it is provocative for more revolutionary ways of thinking about doing it. It does provide a context beyond just thinking about Moon and Mars. Uh, but the one that was my favorite, which we're doing at NASA, is looking at the undiscovered propulsion physics of how you get there. Um, and the 
big three things we want to figure out is how do you move a spacecraft without needing all that propellant mass, which means presumably controlling gravity or interacting with space time or a bunch of other things, um, which we don't know. Exceeding light speed so that all that area on that one chart that we can't reach within a human lifetime might get reachable. And then also addressing the energy issues, which are substantial. Um, so it provides a context for actually thinking about these things. Now, uh, to give you an idea of what I mean by revolutionary thought, well, let's first talk evolutionary thought. Uh, very typically, like when you're talking about sailing ships, um, making them more efficient, more sails, rigging, all that stuff, or uh, taking how we knew how to go to the moon and improving it so that we can do that again better or go to Mars, that's evolutionary research. Revolutionary research is when you have something completely different show up, like a steam engine, and create a completely different way of moving around. Or instead of improving rocketry, of looking at the physics of space-time to see if we can create something like the Enterprise. Um, the, the mindsets on doing these are completely different. This is one more where the people who do it are mastery of their fields and um, inching away at those unknowns. These are ones that are more like, ah, let's leap into the unknown and see what we can figure out. And being uh, sometimes sensationalistic uh, or playful, um, but it's uh, different thoughts. And over the years in my career, there are personality types. And you know, most think like this, and very few think like this. And it's even harder to find the ones who think like this and can do the work careful enough to make real progress. I'll get to that, too. OK, so the question, well, how do you start on the pioneering stuff? What's the actual tactic we use? Well, to begin to understand that, um, here, let's say we have the, oops, got ahead of myself, press the wrong button, um, the rigorous foundations of the sciences as we know it. And over here, we have our grand wishful thinking of how we'd like to do space travel. And from each of those, there are, what's the physics that we do not yet understand? Um, because it's going to have to be in that range, because it's a physics that we already do understand, well, we'd be taking advantage of it for it. So it has to be undiscovered physics. And what are the critical make-break issues that it would take to make these things possible? And when you look at those in detail, you find areas where they overlap. And where they overlap, that gives you a topic you can work on. Often it might just be one small question or whatever, but that's actually, actually filter down and get to something that you can um, work at. And with that, I'll bring up the whole idea faster than light. OK, there's the two main ideas for doing faster than light. I, I won't bring up the quantum ideas because they're even harder to explain. And I'm not quite sure if they really have a, a, a grasp of it, but that's a whole other way of doing it. These are the ones that use general relativity. And the trick is, well, I'll do the warp drive first since it's easier, is even though there's a speed limit for how fast something can move through space time, the rules are different for how fast you can move space time itself or distort space time. And um, this entered the peer-reviewed literature in 1994 uh, for the idea of expanding space-time behind a spacecraft and collapsing it in front and moving this bubble faster than light. The wormhole idea is you distort space-time in such a way where you can create a shortcut. So although your normal path might have been five light years, the path through this tunnel might just be a kilometer. Um, now, here's the, the bad news. The amount of energy it takes to do these things is enormous, even beyond that chart that I showed with the conventional things. Um, there's also some issues about if you could do this, would you create time travel paradoxes, where you could come back from your journey to stop yourself from ever having embarked on the journey in the first place, and you just get confusing stuff. Th those are actually debated, and debated in the literature. Yeah, very confusing. Um, the other thing is that this energy has to be negative. I mean, we'll mostly think of positive energy. Normal mass is positive energy. Um, there are some examples in quantum physics of negative energy. But getting to the details about, well, can you bring this into some sort of physical form that we can work with and that it has those effects, we don't know yet. That's part of the where the investigations are on that point of even can you do those sort of energy states. How many recognize this image? Oh, thank goodness. Not many of you. Um, it really looks cool, doesn't it? Um, this was along an article that said NASA was working on warp drive. No. This was hype. Um, this is really cool. I, I love the artwork on that, except that you see there's a person standing in there. This is in orbit, and somehow they have 
gravity on board, uh, which would be a breakthrough unto itself. Um, about a year ago, and they still kind of linger, there's some stories in the press about NASA working on uh, certain breakthrough engines and stuff like that. Uh, take it with a grain of salt, or here's some better advice. How to tell when you've got a crackpot or a, uh, <coughs> a shyster uh, versus potential visionary. If you read these things, if it sounds like a technical report, okay maybe there's something there. If it sounds like a sales pitch, no. Uh -uh. Um, are the people who are doing it, are they upfront about what the real challenges are? I mean, the mic break issues, that why it might not work? Okay. If they're not, they're ignoring that, red flag. Um, and what they're talking about, are they talking more about making sure that their information is correct and reliable? Okay. If they kind of skip that issue, red flag. And, um, and also look at the uh, track record of their work. And another red flag to look for, if they're naming things after themselves, <laughs> and that happens to be in the prior story. I won't go into those details, but um, unfortunately, when I was doing this at NASA, there's the physics issues and stuff like that, which are indeed challenging. But I spent 80% of my actual time finding the healthy middle ground between the sensationalistic hype, um, which doesn't really do any good, and the pedantic disdain where people say, oh, this will be a little possible, and staying in that middle ground where you're willing to entertain the possibilities, but then you're building from things that you can credibly do and know. And that exercise was actually the bulk of what I did and still remains a large challenge of trying to get this work done. And if anyone's interested in becoming students to work on that, be alert to that, that it's not just about the technical work, it's about the attitude that you have when doing the work. And impartiality is a great one. If you go in saying, you know, I don't know if this is, if this is going to work or not, let's see what the results show. Great. If you go into it, I'm sure my idea is right and I'm going to prove it. No, don't go that way. Okay. Now we're going to delve into some playful thinking about hypothetical space drives. Um, and at this point, you can consider this science fiction um, because these are really illustrations just to kind of get us into some of the thought, which I'll get there. What if there was some magical way where instead of bringing on propellant that we threw out board, where we could push against the surrounding mass and move our spacecraft the other way. Okay, that sounds like that would be cool. Well, let's extend this to what if instead of just the surrounding mass, what if we could do that to the entire mass of the entire universe, to where we push our spacecraft in one direction and the entire universe moves in the other. Now, if there are any physicists in the audience who are going, okay, what did the universe just move relative to if it's the universe? Um, the kind of questions that this provokes, which gets down to things like inertial frames and other stuff like that, is kind of the point of thinking like this, of what are those unanswered questions? What are some of those gray areas that we have to dig in a little bit deeper to try and solve? And uh, while most physics is looking at these same unsolved problems from the point of view of the age of the universe and fate of the universe, when you look at it from a propulsion point of view, same questions, but you're looking at them from a different angle and hopefully might discover something that wouldn't be discovered otherwise. Um, I don't know if any of this is going to actually become possible or not, but these are the kind of like trains of thought to get you into the details. Well, here's another one, and one that you can actually uh, try at home. Um, and some of you might have already noticed, if you have a, a sink or a bin filled with water and you put something that floats on it, this is our little uh, floating spaceship, and right behind it you uh, drop just a uh, small amount of dishwashing detergent, um, that vehicle will move off to the side. Now that vehicle didn't have any propulsion on it. What you did is you changed the properties of the water in an imbalanced way, which then pushed the vehicle. So you can use those sort of analogies too, thinking about space time. Rather than having something on the vehicle that um, has some propulsion or rocketry, is there some way to modify the surrounding space time in an imbalanced way that will push it? And then of course you get into the secondary questions like, well, what are you pushing against? And so on and so forth. But I use this again as kind of the mental analogies or the thought processes that begin to nudge you in into asking, okay, what are the real pieces of physics that we know that you would take next steps in to look to? 
and on doing this on just the idea of hypothetical space drives. Now, I don't expect you to read all these things. The point here is only to show that there's more than one way of thinking about it. And a lot of them are clear dead ends. Um, but the good news of this is that if we only need one of those not to be a dead end. Um, and uh, I mean, that's probably enough said on that. The, the, the main point is, is that with these things, there are a variety of ideas out there that have been only looked at a little bit. Um, we have not exhausted the possibilities. Um, unfortunately, a lot of dead ends, and some of the dead ends were painfully sensationalistic. But it's, uh, it's all part of the process of actually uh, making progress. Now, because of those challenges of, well, what do you study? Where are we now? Myself and a number of colleagues put together a book uh, a number of years ago. We published it in 2009. And so we looked at, well, what are the things you would need to have to be true to make these space vehicles a reality? Where is the physics today? What has already been thought of? And then what are those next step issues? What are some of the questions that are potentially suitable for a graduate thesis to work on to just chip away at those unknowns and to compile those into something that um, where we tried to be as impartial and rigorous as we could. Granted, there are some um, flaws and other things. And uh, this is a graduate level book. We don't have a public companion book for it. I don't know if they'll ever succeed at that. That's one of the things that would be cool to do. Um, but writing about these things at that level is hard. Uh, it's hard to write it at this level, too. Um, but, okay, going back more now, I'm spreading back out to the, the general challenges. As far as next step challenges, for the people who actually dabble in this, oh, I guess one thing to say, most people who work on this have a day job, and they do this as kind of a cool thing on the side. There are a few people who actually get paid day jobs to do this, but that's not the case yet. Um, on the world ships, some of the questions that are coming up now is, well, what sort of biome would you want to bring with you? How much do you need to bring? How much soil? What type of soil? Do you bring chickens? Do you bring uh, cows? Um, what sort of plants do you bring? All that stuff is actually um, uh, being looked at a little bit more so than it was in the uh, 70s. Uh, the questions about sustainable society models, which is not being looked at as much as I know about, other than the questions are being broached. And then about how do you build these enormous things in space? As far as the people doing the technology, um, the technology based on physics we already know, the kind of things that they're doing is system level studies, meaning that if you had an entire vehicle, how would it all balance out putting these things together? Um, and how would you do things like your uh, power sources and your radiators? Okay, radiators. I've got to say something about that. When you look at even the science fiction vehicles, which are based on pretty plausibly on technology you have, and often when you see the things in the technical papers, they're missing radi thermal radiators. There's ex the excess heat that you have from the inefficiencies, you have to radiate that to space. And um, the more of that excess energy you have, or the more energy you're talking about, the bigger those things have. And let's see, what's a, I should have had a good graphic of that one. Um, in the movie 2001, which was a long time ago, they had a spacecraft that went to Jupiter. It was huge. It was very long. It had a, a sphere at the front of it where the, the crew was in, um, nuclear engines on the back. NASA redid, uh, some friends of mine at NASA redid a study of that. That was a science fiction vehicle of, what if that was a real vehicle, and how big would it look? And it was about the same size and length, but the radiators for that were about this big. Um, so. Okay. Um, so that's something that often kind of gets overlooked in some of these studies. Another one that is a, a contentious issue is magnetic nozzles. Um, a lot of these ideas for fusion rockets or even antimatter rockets and things like that, they require really good magnetic nozzles which don't exist. And often in the studies, they need to be superconducting, which might work for a while, but once you put too much power into it, so that's another little detail to look into. Equipment longevity, or otherwise known as the warranty period. We might be able to push that up to two centuries now. Um, and if you saw an interstellar flight, two centuries isn't really all that long for doing some of these distances. So that's an issue, too. And then, how do you build these things? How do you mine all the propellants? How do you uh, power them up? Um, all those sort of details are being looked at, too. Um, and what's cool about this stuff, even though that might seem premature, 
Um, again, this gets into that difference between revolutionary and revolutionary thinking. Um, there's already some companies trying to get investments to plan to do asteroid mining. Um, the question is, okay, if you did that and you're going to use it for space, what would be an optimal way to set this up? Where's the good places to go? Where would you build things and stuff like that? Those are extra steps that the near-term folks aren't really thinking about, and there's all sorts of ways of doing it, so that's part of that um, area um, that other folks are thinking about. And when it comes to the propulsion physics stuff, uh, when we're talking about space drives, some of the critical unknowns are what are inertial frames, what is space-time really made out of, and how can you interact with it. And if you're talking about faster than light, uh, the key issues are about negative energy, uh, how do you create it, can you uh, make it in the geometries that you want, and things like that. Now, granted, there's a whole bunch of other questions that come after that, but this will have to wait until we chip away at these things. These are about marching away in small steps uh, to make this happen. And as far as who's doing this, um, I mentioned before this idea of Breakthrough Starshot. That's the Ray Milner um, uh, $100 million, and we're using laser boosted tiny space sails. And I don't really know yet how they're going to go about getting the work done. That's an unknown. They're, they're relatively new. As far as another group, uh, a few years ago, DARPA, Defense Advanced Research Project Agency, uh, started an organization called the 100-Year Starship. Um, one, that means how long it might take before you develop technology, before you can launch a starship. And what they've been doing mostly is explaining the value, oops, uh, uh, explaining the value of those things uh, to the public, and they do that by hosting public conferences and having speakers and things like that. Then you have the Tennessee Valley Interstellar Workshop, which I know sounds very um, uh, local, um, but and they are, they're a, a spin-off of an annual event that used to be done in Italy, but what they do is they bring together the practitioners, the people who actually work on this stuff, to get together and not only present the results, but to work in reading sessions to chip away at some of the issues, like some of the world ship stuff I showed before was actually done at those meetings. Um, another one is Icarus Interstellar, um, and they're doing uh, project studies on that, that data list, that big, large vehicle with the fusion rockets, uh, revisiting that from the point of view of more contemporary technology. Um, they were supposed to be finished with their study last year, but it's completely normal to run late on um, doing things like this. It was a five-year study. Um, but they also look at the space infrastructure design projects and stuff like that. And then there's the Lenar created, which right now is a... Okay, too far this um, Which is trying to find the pioneers who are out there, getting them to collaborate together, and then... Um, with publishing that information to hopefully inspire other people. Uh, we also have a, a news forum to keep up with these things called Centauri Dreams. Um, and just another side note, like lessons learned when I talked about the 80% was trying to figure out how to do it. Our original tactic for making progress, we learned, did not work. So I'm having to try and think, okay, what to do differently to make progress happen? Um, and that is part of the big picture of getting things done, not just the actual work itself, but how do you package the work and the team of people to get things done. Um, and this phrase here, ad astra incrementis, means to the stars and steps, where each step is getting progressively bigger. I like that, that one word has all that meaning in it. Um, that's kind of the philosophy here. We're working in little baby steps, but that lead farther out to these things. And if you're interested in this subject, and you want to learn more, here's uh, three things I think might be worthwhile. For general news on all things Interstellar, uh, the Centauri Dream site, it's a, all the articles are based on stuff that would be in the peer-reviewed literature. So it's not the sensationalist stuff. Um, what he also has is a moderated forum after that where people add comments. And because it's moderated and uh, tightly controlled, the quality of the comments has gotten really good over the years. So you can have some the discussions you see later are very, very meaningful. Um, another thing that's fun to play around with is uh, exoplanetapp.com, which works on phones of more than one type. Um, the one that I have for my phone, uh, the base version is free. If you pay extra money, you get extra features to it. But I only have the free one, and it's really cool. You can zoom around the galaxy and see where all these planets are. Um, and if you're particularly interested in the habitable exoplanets, now, 
just say that Kepler and the things that were in the news uh, Tuesday, they're about all exoplanets, the big ones, the small ones, and everything. If you're particularly interested in the ones that are potentially habitable, uh, uh, this group, um, uh, Puerto Rico, uh, yes, Arecibo, um, and they have a nice catalog of information more specifically on the uh, habitable exoplanets, and I found that very useful too. So those are places, if you think this is cool and you want to keep in touch, um, that's where I would recommend the starting points to get off to. And with that, I will open it up to questions. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, the question was um, based on how our technology is advancing exponentially, getting more and more. Uh, what's my best guess of when we might be able to launch an interstellar mission? I'm going to answer that in two ways. Um, I'm going to break this into a precursor mission, meaning a first mission that might be intent for interstellar realize it's not going to really reach any destination, but it's for the sake of practicing the technology and making things happen. <sighs> 20 years. Um, but when we're talking about a serious interstellar mission, the potential probe that's big enough, and back on that energy chart uh, that I showed, the, the one that took a lot of energy, not the one kilogram one, uh, but was only about the mass of an automobile which is, is still pretty small for a probe. And that was several centuries. Um, the one <sighs> monkey wrench in things that I had no idea how it would affect things is the ascension of AI. If artificial intelligence uh, does indeed become uh, more adept at thinking than humanity, and does not have all our cognitive dysfunctions like confirmation bias, um, difficulty unlearning, and all those things. Um, hopefully, it could go through more what-if scenarios about thinking things out and coming up with solutions faster. I would hope that that would happen, um, in which case I'm not sure how many years after that uh, to get the breakthroughs. But it, within this century, seems like a reasonably fair bet. Um, the other caveats of that is that there's the technology extrapolation, but there's also the societal influences. Right now, a lot of the technology for some of these things that have been talked about, um, they're not really, they don't get much support. A lot of people that work on them are volunteers, and that's more of a, a, a sociological thing than a matter of the technology. Um, if our society was more aligned towards pushing these things, things would probably happen uh, faster. At our, the way we are kind of now, I'm not sure how much all that's going to progress. So when I think it might take a century before we had a really genuine interstellar mission launch, or maybe 20 years before we have a precursor happen, that is my bias of how that plays in with society's priorities. Um, if, society, if, if society had a dedicated push that, oh, we need to do this very intensely, I'm not sure how much farther that would push things up, uh, because then I don't know what real physics, uh, technology and physics limits are going to be bucking up against um, sooner. But you know, well, you know, for now, uh, I'll stick with maybe 20 years for a precursor and before the end of the century for a, a serious uh, mission. Yeah. Uh, I have a three-part question. I'll call it good, bad, good, bad, and funny. Okay. Um, the good, and I'd like to hear your thoughts on all of these. On the good side, I'd like to hear your thoughts on time dilation, which is if you can accelerate something up to near the speed of light, people on board that ship will experience time more slowly. Yeah. Um, the bad is that as far as we know, there is no matter with negative energy density. And the funny is, uh, as technology progresses, we can increase the energy expenditure and get places faster. And uh, it's kind of funny that a ship that leaves Earth later would pass the one that left Earth earlier. Oh. 
due to technological advancement. So when does it ever make sense to send a ship out? Okay. <laughs> and I will repeat those. Um, the first one was uh, uh, using uh, time dilation for your advantage. Okay, I didn't mention it here, but if you have a spaceship that is traveling near the speed of light, um, from the point of view of the people on that spaceship, the, they're going to oh, how to say how to, how to phrase this without tripping over my tongue. Yeah, in other words, if you have, uh, from the point of view of people on the Earth watching the spaceship, if it looks like it's going to take them five years to reach the destination, from the point of view of the people on the spaceship, no, they'll get there much sooner than that. So for the crew, um, they don't have as much uh, time to wait. The only catch with that is the extra energy you need to push things up to relativistic speed. Um, it's a power function. It gets, it gets hard. So, um, yeah, for the people who are on board the spaceship, it's an advantage. The amount of energy you need to bring it happen. Okay. Number B was about the, uh, that we don't have any negative matter that we know of. And that's true. Um, what we have is some, um, debated is, uh, that's probably fair, uh, debated interpretations of things like uh, a chasmal vacuum or some other situations that are relatively negative energy, but how to engineer them into something that will have an effect is where the question area is, because all the ones that I know so far are kind of like isolated cases, and as soon as you do anything to the geometry to create those, they cease to exist, or you can't really use them to uh, uh, to do useful things. Or the, the one that I know of as far as useful things, um, just a short segue, chasm effect, two conducting plates uh, together, get them close enough um, that it does not allow as many energy states between the plates or on the outside, so there's pressure for the plates to come together. Um, there's a, a study about, well, could you use that to do work, to have the uh, plates collapse and do work in the process? Yes, you can, but it's no free lunch because um, you need to put more energy back in to pull the plates back out to repeat the process. So it becomes kind of just like a, a battery. Um, and then the, the last one, uh, which actually has a name, he asked, when is the right time to launch a mission if sometime in the future you'll launch a mission with more advanced technology that will get there sooner? And uh, that has two phrases, the incessant obsolescence postulate um, or the, the weight equation. And uh, the situation with that is that when you look at the energy for doing interstellar flight, it's nonlinear. And you will reach a certain point in that, uh, depending upon the assumptions of technological progress and the energy of the, the spaceflight, um, where there is an optimum time that if you wait later, you're not going to get there any sooner. Um, and that's even including the technology getting. But that is limited to. Um, the physics as we know it and the relativistic energy. Um, the other things that make that postulate uh, potentially fall apart is social stagnation. Um, or, gosh, what was... I'm trying to blank. There's some other things too. It's, uh, it's just a postulate, meaning it's something that someone threw out there um, that will collapse under a number of conditions. So the idea of waiting to the optimum time, mm, there's no real point of wonder. There's also the learning curve of even though you're launching something that you know is not going to get there potentially faster than something you might launch five years later, there's all that learning that you do in the process of making that happen, which will enable making that better one uh, later. Okay. No, um, that's, th we split it into two different categories. Oh, um, he said uh, first, before we ask the question, that we assume that we're uh, taking a person on these journeys. Um, no, even though uh, we break these into uncrewed probes, where you're just sending a scientific probe to make measurements at the destination uh, to get information that you couldn't from a telescope. Um, and then when it turns, when it comes to the subject of people, then we're talking world ships. Unless we have the kind of physics breakthroughs that we'd like where we can build the Starship Enterprise, but right now we don't have enough to plan on that. So, but Let's assume that you could 
Okay. Nine tenths of the speed. Okay. You're moving an exoskeleton, an endoskeleton, at a rate that is far less than that point. It takes several years to gradually get out of the speed without destroying the endoskeleton. And then you'd have to maybe run in here like some shorter period of time if you're going to cross 25 trillion miles away. Well, if, if the question was about the effects of, of speeding up and slowing down without damaging the crew and stuff like that. Um, yeah, it, yeah, actually a, a, a modest acceleration will get you up to a decent speed without much time. Um, I thought you were going to bring up the, um, the issue of once you're going at high speed, what if you cl uh, collide with a dust particle? Um, because at those high energies, dust particles become uh, quite friendly. Yeah. Um, with uh, Arthur C. Clarke's book, Rama. Um, I haven't read it. There are people in my network who have. Um, by the way, with the book that we did, we got Arthur C. Clarke to agree to write the forward one month before he died. Um, so we got Bert Rutan to fill in, in this, this place. But, but no, um, science fiction writers are within our network too, because a lot of the science fiction writers are, are scientists and engineers. And also, uh, to cue Robert Forward, who was the one who did some of the light sail studies, um, he used the science fiction stories to help him think through the technology. Um, what's good about science fiction, other than the inspiring and fun stuff, is that it gives you a context around which to to think what are the important features of, that you want the technology to have at the human level, the meaningful things, and then run through that. So it has value in that context. And I'll go into another question in the back. And can you speak up? I have a hearing problem. Peter's question first is that I've talked about the advancing of technology part, and then there's the societal part to help make these things happen. Um, and yeah, those are both camps. And then the last part, if I got it right, about the idea of um, developing a processor or electronics that can last for uh, more than two centuries or whatever. I know that there are people who are thinking about those things, and a lot of other details in here about like the, um, uh, the dust mitigation, uh, about acceleration rates, about spacecraft construction, that it, there's no room to go into there. Um, and there are papers out on those things. Sometimes it's challenging to figure out what search term to use, because on new fields, sometimes people use different terms to mean the same thing. Um, I do not know of who are the leading players when it comes to making long duration uh, equipment. Huh? Uh, Terry Phillips, I think his name is, the Long Now Foundation. Like oh, the 2000 year clock. Okay, um, yeah, just a second. Uh, how many people have heard of the Long Now Foundation? 
Okay, their premise is, is to try and get people to think uh, long term again. And they even start by when they have a date like 2016, they put a leading zero in front of it. Um, they're trying to make a clock that will last for 10,000 years. 10, years. Um, they're concerned with uh, how you uh, store data so that, it won't, uh, so that it will last that long. So uh, something that you record now, you'll still be able to read in 10,000 years. I don't know about the actual technology that they're doing. I know that they're making the point of trying to do that. Yeah, they're working on, yeah, they're working on the engineering. The okay, okay. Um, I, that's good to know, because I lost track of I, I knew in purpose what they were doing, and that, you know, it's in line here, but this is also a very long-term thing. Uh, I, and I knew about the clock, but I didn't know about the other things. Uh, the only other people that I know that had looked at it were at the... Uh, Johns Hopkins uh, physics labs, the ones who have done space probes in the past. And that's where I got the unofficial uh, two century uh, limit. And that was, I don't know, five to 10 years ago I got it. But um, yeah, if you can make a very long lasting piece of electronics, and hopefully that still use the same communication technology once you reach the destination to send the signal back, um, that's another consideration. If you have a, a a probe that uses a certain type of communication. If you're talking millennia, will the technology it has to send signals back still be able, will there be any old equipment to be able to read it? Uh, that's all part of the picture. And when the people toy around with these things, and those questions are good, um, there's a lot of those details that have kind of been thought out to a bit and published. Uh, none of them are answered formally, and it is, none of this is cast in stone or whatever, but there's a lot of work out there if you want to dig through the literature to see uh, some of these things, so. Yes? So, um, if, if, like, a, ha a half of a, and, and a half of a planet is, like, too far away, and it takes take, like, a whole human lifetime, mm -hmm. and, like, can't get there, then I don't think it's going to be, like, how much energy. Okay. She asked the question, if there's a half of a planet that's too far away to get there normally, why don't we do use wormholes and stuff? Well, that's the, the wormholes, that's part of the undiscovered physics. We kind of know that the theories are there to maybe make them happen, but there's still a lot of research. We don't know if we can do a wormhole, um, but the idea of considering that in the things that we look at is there, as well as trying to figure out how to make people be able to live on a world ship long enough to where their descendants, of their children, of the children of children, um, reach the destination. And something that hasn't been brought up yet is imagine you have one of these world ships and after a few millennia they finally get to the uh, planet that they wanted to go. Where the people on the ship want to move their ship? That's their home. That's all they've known. This alien world is like, I don't know, much the same way as people on Earth who would want to get on one of those world ships if they'd been on home. And then there's the question of compatible biomes. If you go down on that world and there is already life there, um, will it kill it or, you, or, or will it kill you or vice versa, um, even unintentionally? And, and, you know, all those are things that are, a lot of these the questions have been brought up and the questions have been refined to where we can start chipping away better at the answers, but we are nowhere close to having really definitive answers. Um, but the other side of that, that means there's all sorts of room for making progress. Oh, to do it one more? Oh, okay. Um, imagine the whole mass of Jupiter. And now you scrunch that down, and Jupiter is huge, into a ring that's one meter in diameter. And then you have to convert it into being, instead of positive mass, being negative mass. Um, it's kind of on that scale. So it's, uh, that's the best way I can think to describe it. I mean, an awful lot of energy. <laughs> Oh, let's keep. Oh, um, I'll go, go, go with you in the back. Actually, be joining the 
Okay. Yeah. Okay. She asked, uh, for the sociological aspects that we brought out, um, who might be doing that and how would you join them? And oh my gosh, what is the name for that field? There, there is a relatively new field. Is it called astrosociology? Um, I'm not sure I'm remembering that correct. Unfortunately, the person that I worked with on this was Catherine Denning. Uh, she was actually an anthropologist at York University, and she's been on medical leave for I don't know how long. Um, and uh, I have not stayed in touch with that community, um, but my first guess is to Google search Astro sociology. Um, the other thing that's come to mind is there were two people recently. Oh, um, and there's articles on Centauri Dreams. Uh, and they have a search site. Uh, but there were two people recently that were talking about the ethics of colonization and what was the other one? Um, but I, if you could find those articles, find those people's names, and then uh, from their names and their literature, reference lists and stuff, you, you might get there. But unfortunately, I uh, don't know that many practicing anthropologists or sociologists who actually work on that. I just keep coming across it as an issue. It keeps coming up in discussion, uh, and sometimes it percolates out, and I lose track of it after that. How, how are you doing on time for Cliff? Well, I, I think it's, it's about up. Uh, maybe you want to do a summary of it. Maybe a couple more. I'll do two more questions and then I'll, I'll wrap it up. Okay, well, let me do the one for you. I was first. just wondering uh, one of the projects my son had when he was taking uh, his PhD in materials engineering in Michigan was buckyball. He was uh, assigned to do buckyballs where they would entrap lift and stable lift in atoms inside and then he would explode them. And, and the fusion of the lithium atoms. So the question was, how much energy was being produced by that compared to the energy in the manufacture of the lithium atom? So has that been considered by NASA because it was under NASA contract? Okay. Uh, the question was about using um, buckyballs and uh, lithium as an energy production method. I am not familiar with those specific details. What I do know is that things along similar lines, also using um, uh, bucky tubes or whatever for storing hydrogen at higher density, have looked at. There's a lot of things that get looked at on occasion and make a certain amount of progress. And then there's ebbs and flows of what something uh, gets support on. On the one that you mentioned specifically, I don't know that enough to even know what sort of energy densities they're talking about. If I have to guess off of the top of my, well, no, I'm not going to guess off the top of my head because I really don't know enough of it to uh, comment intelligently. Um, Unfortunately, I do not know about that, so I'm, I'm not sure what to say. And so there's a, yeah. Here's how that works. And, um, oh, that's right. Uh, he asked, well, you know, if you're having these long journeys, where do you get all the food for the animals and the people and stuff like that? Because that's a lot of food. OK, uh, first I'm going to use the Earth as an example. Um, because these world ships, in principle, they're trying to copy some of what happens on the Earth. From the Earth, we have an energy source, the sun. And that energy makes plants grow, which then the animals eat, and then other animals eat the animals, and which turn into waste products, which go back into the soil, which help make the food grow. So it's a cycle. And um, even though the Earth continues to amass 
more material, uh, micrometeorites and stuff like that, I think it's tons per year. Um, in a sense, we are sort of a, a closed system where all these things are recycled. So the, the food that goes through the animals that they eat comes back out of the animals in forms of a waste, which just goes back into the soil to, uh, these are cycles. And so in engineering these world ships, they're trying to figure out, okay, what makes a workable cycle to where you will have the food being created, being consumed, turning into waste, coming back into food, and they need an energy source. Um, and that's where they're looking to various nuclear power things to supply that energy. Uh, so it's a matter of a cycle. And uh, to use uh, perhaps an uncomfortable phrase uh, from a science fiction discussion, when a little boy asks his uh, mom about this, are we eating grandmother? Um, meaning that, you know, when, on a world trip, when people die, um, their bodies will have to be part of going back into the cycle to refurbish them. You just can't. 100%. They have to recycle 100%. So in a sense, yes, you will be eating grandma eventually in an indirect way. Um, so, yeah, that's part of the difficulty. <laughs> yes. Okay, uh, first the Starshot one, which I talked about before, uh, that's the one that's come around recently. That's the one for using um, 100 gigawatt uh, station of lasers to focus on a four meter, by four meter by four meter sail to push something the mass of roughly a cell phone to Alpha Centauri. They've just got started. They've laid out their challenges. I have no idea really how they're going to go about chipping away at those challenges. I do know that the prior people who were involved um, with some of the power booming and the space sales and stuff like that have been called upon as advisors, but I don't really know what exactly they're going to do to overcome those challenges. Um, in terms of interstellar flight things, they didn't pick the easiest. The easiest is a solar sail, but they probably picked the next easiest uh, power beaming small sail things. Uh, but granted, there's a lot of challenges they have to go through. I have no idea how they're going to set themselves up to chip through those problems. I don't really know whether they'll be able to achieve what they're going to achieve. But the one thing that is different is that someone's making a concerted effort on something that before was just paper studies and an occasional experimental test on something related. Now the yeah, well, okay, and the communication. The second question is, how much energy does it take to do the communication, like to send the signal back? And I don't remember that answer. Um, I remember it coming up, and also the issue. The communication is a subset unto its own. Um, and the naive first thought that goes in is that the probe that you send has all the power it needs or the uh, conversion of power using the sunlight from where it is uh, to do the job. Um, and there's limits with that. There's also limits of, well, how fast do you send the data back? How uh, how much data, and there's, well, there's trades in those. I don't remember the numbers. What I do remember is that that naive approach of putting all the burden on the spacecraft uh, limits things. And the idea of sending a train of multiple spacecraft and using those as communication relays or backups is some of the thought. I am not well versed on the pros and cons of all of that discussion. Um, and I don't even remember the names of the people who've been working on that, uh, other than to know that those questions have been raised, there have been people playing the numbers, and there have been more than one uh, version of solving a problem that have been thought out and is in the literature. I'm not sure what search terms to use. Intercellular communication, I guess, would be one, but there's definitely uh, papers out there that would have those numbers. If you're hitting your spaceship with um, when you're talking interstellar distances, even with a laser, the yeah, and the amount you get back, it's uh, 
Again, I don't remember those numbers. Other people that have that. Uh, Oh, you're saying, you're saying the laser. We, we can talk about it. Okay, it's, I, know it's really, I don't remember those numbers, but there are, um, the idea of using optical instead of radio is definitely in the mix. And for this, I, my, my throat's beginning to dry out, so um, I think I have to call, the, I'm going to call off the um, uh, questions to just sum up that interstellar flight is not just doing space flight more intensely. It's a different problem. It opens up opportunities to consider sociological issues and about meaning of life and worldships and sustainability, which is cool. Um, it provides a venue to look for more revolutionary solutions um, that we don't normally have room to fit into normal programs, which is cool, which includes looking for undiscovered propulsion physics for really cool things. And that along those lines is that how you do the work is important. We need to stick in that, that healthy mental middle ground between the sensationalistic hype and the pedantic disdain of, of considering the possibilities but doing it very uh, rationally and partially and you know, chipping away at the unknowns and then taking the findings as they really are. And it might turn out that these things that for the faster than light and the non propellant space drives or even the, the giant lasers, it might be something that we just can't do. Um, we don't know yet, uh, but there are some folks chipping away at these issues, and most of them do so in addition to a day job if, if you get uh, paid for it. But it's a cool thing, and we shall see as the uh, years roll ahead uh, what happens. Um, uh, a decade or two ago, when I was still dabbling in this stuff, I did not. I would not have guessed that someone would actually be willing to fund uh, laser uh, sale missions. I did not foresee the creation of an organization like 100 Year uh, Starship. And um, so th you know, there's a few things that uh, uh, might still happen that are completely unanticipated. And with that, I need to wrap up. Thank you.